Thank you very much for your kind words of introduction. And as you said, I will give my part, which will focus on the history of the Ghent altarpiece. Um, and then after that, give the floor to Olivia, who is head of the conservation team. Um, about the <coughs> Ghent altarpiece, we all know it. We all know it from recent information in the press. It is dated 1432, the brothers Van Eyck, Hubert and Jan, and the measurements are absolutely incredible. If you open the altarpiece, it's 4 meters 60 broad and 3 meters 50 high. So it's bigger than the reproduction that you see there on the wall, and a reproduction of excellent quality, by the way. But Art historians have been debating and are still debating enormously up till the day of today about who did what to the Ghent altarpiece. Hubert, the eldest brother who died in 1426, and Jan, the second, and what was their uh, part in this ensemble. And as always, the moment of restoration is the moment when research can be done. The first phase of the restoration, and uh, Livia de Pert will talk about that, is now being done on the exterior, the closed panels, representing the Annunciation, the two donors, Joost Veit and Elisabeth Berlut, the two St. John's, and when the altarpiece is closed, as you may, might feel when you look at it like that, it's a moment of waiting, of promise, the Annunciation of what would come. And when you open it, you have the revelation of what is promised. And there already you have an ambiguous thing in the use of the altarpiece. Now it is in a vitrine and the actual act of closing and opening is not happening anymore. So thank God we have this as a possibility. If we think about the two brothers, Hubert and Jan, and if we know about them, it is all due to an inscription that is painted on the base of the frames, of the original frames of the altarpiece. It's, of course, a text in Latin, and if I might give the translation in English, you will feel maybe with me how beautiful and how poetic it is also. So we can read the painter Hubert van Eyck, a greater man than whom cannot be found, began this work. Jan, his brother, second in art, completed the weighty task at the request of your fate. And he invites you with this verse on the 6th of May 1432, within a chronogram, to look at what has been done. So we are invited as participants, as onlookers, uh, to the feast, so to speak. As I said, many conjectures, many different hypotheses has been, have been formulated and drawn uh, about the original place of the altarpiece in the Fayt Chapel in Ghent Cathedral. This is one of the uh, important uh, hypotheses of Elisabeth Danens. Unfortunately, she has uh, left us. She has committed herself to this study uh, till the great age of 92 and uh, she has done research in the Fight Chapel in the St. Bavo Cathedral and came to this presentation where you do not have the two registers, the upper register and the lower register close to each other, on top of each other but separated and in link with the architecture. Many uh, conjectures have been done also in the past. I am just showing you one of the many, many uh, representations of the Ghent altarpiece. Uh, mid 19th century, a, painter by a Ghent, painting by a Ghent uh, painter, De Noter. And he, uh, let's say, made his painting leaving out the Baroque architecture that has been added, of course, in the 16th century. But you see something very important, I think, also in the perception, and that is that the light, the daylight, comes from the uh, window 
to the right and uh, has its function in the representation of the three-dimensional illusion of space and rendering of materials. So back to uh, St. Bavo Cathedral, I can imagine that many of you have been there. The original place in the Fair Chapel to the upper right and since 1986 it has been placed at the <coughs> lower left, number five, in the Villa Chapel. And that because here, the, as I said, the original place in the Fair Chapel, the Baroque architecture, and many of you have visited it probably before, I see some people smiling in the room, before it was transported in 1986 to the Villa Chapel. The 80s, you will remember, were, were also years of, of threats of, uh, yes, I think that there was a lot of anguish. We have a lot of anguish today with uh, uh, violence going on around us, but also in the mid 80s it was present. And <clears throat> the altarpiece was safeguarded in a kind of glass vitrine that would protect it against any form of violence. Uh, the roof of the vitrine and uh, of the space is really concrete, so it's uh, safe also against bombing and things like that. Um, but also it is in a glass vitrine of the mid 80s and you have the reflection of the lights. You cannot come close, you cannot see it closed. So there are also disadvantages to that vitrine and it is glass dating from the mid 80s and as you can see with me, it's rather green, isn't it? So we are looking at the Ghent altarpiece through green spectacles. Uh, at the end of uh, 2009, a kind of alarm bell started to ring softly in the beginning and then with more concern that the climate within the vitrine, I mean we are here at the Brafa and we know what it is to preserve works of art uh, in a safe way. Also it cannot be too warm, it cannot be too dry and all these things. We, that's what we call passive of preventive conservation. We need to have a stable climate and if you see a chart like that where you have the temperature fluctuations and the humidity fluctuations of that order, really it is a time for concern. And when there's a problem, uh, and that is the paradox, the only painting that suffered most from those climate changes you know that one of the panels had been stolen in 1934, the judges. A copy had been made in 1945 by Jeff van der Weeck, and I will come back to that. And that copy had suffered most. So the original Van Eyck had suffered a little bit, but not significantly. So an urgent conservation was um, <coughs> asked for. There was uh, funding from um, the Flemish government. Uh, the Getty Foundation uh, subsidized uh, documentation and uh, bringing all that information, also photographic documentation, on a website closer to Van Eyck at kikirpa.be. You can just consult it uh, if you want. But most important of all, the team under direction of Livia, who will uh, take the floor in a moment, uh, did some observations, they did the urgent conservation in situ in the Ghent Cathedral. Also, uh, the Getty Foundation funded the training program for young panel paintings conservators. And that is, I think, a nice thing also for the future. I mean, all of us know that we are at a certain point stopping with work and then it is fantastic to be able to transmit knowledge and uh, experience to the next generation. And that happened in St. Barbara Cathedral, working on the Ghent altarpiece. As I said, the documentation and technical examination, lasting support, and you can consult that uh, at home, behind your computer, which is really luxury. Um, and at the same time, we made the first exercise of doing some work, conservation work, restoration, not restoration yet, but conservation, technical investigation, within close scrutiny of the public itself. I am now 
68, when I was very young, uh, I started my training at the Institute in Brussels and it was still a kind of secrecy around the job. You had private conservators, you had museum conservators. I'm looking at Livia, maybe she, she remembers that vaguely. But it, everything was done behind closed doors. There was a secrecy, you know, you, you, you took risks or not, but you didn't want to share that with the public. Well, not with the Ghent altarpiece and not in 2010, 11 and 12. And that has been uh, going on also in the Museum of Ghent, and Livia will talk about that. But it was fascinating to see how concerned the people were, how um, worried about the safekeeping, and that's the most important thing. We had also the opportunity, this is the back of the big center panel that you see there, and what we did was bring people in the Fair Chapel, in the Villa Chapel, in the last gate, sorry, uh, people who are very rare, in fact. You have John Bizaka, George Bizaka from the Metropolitan in uh, New York, Jose La Fuente from the Prado, uh, and Ray Marchand from uh, the Hampton Carr Institute. If you think about experts having within their working experience visual and professional experience about diagnosis, what to do with fragile panels, then those guys are the people you want to get to the object. So not something by email, but you need to have them close to the object. The nice thing was that they disagreed in the beginning. One said, you have to do a total this or total that, and the other one said, oh no, no, minimal, minimal. And then finally they have been talking to each other, looking at the same thing, and that dialogue is crucial to reach a consensus, and the consensus is what we need. We cannot say a little bit of that and a little bit of that. No, we need a treatment proposal. Here you see the dismantling of the altarpiece, heavy, rather heavy oak panels, uh, in a confined space. That confined space was designed, ladies and gentlemen, to protect it against violence. But if you would have to, you would need to take it out quickly, you just cannot do that. It takes eight hours to build a scaffolding, to dismantle it, and to transport it outside. So the protection against violence can also be a hazard. Uh, understand? And here you see how closely you need to be, you need really to be careful by transporting it. Now quickly the history of the altarpiece going in big steps, you know. By its beauty, by the extraordinary beauty of the object, it also uh, provoked the greed of very powerful people. The French troops coming in, Flanders, and, well, the side panels they didn't like very much, so they took the centre panels and brought it to what would become the Musée Napoléon in Paris. And there they were treated, and in those archives that are still present, uh, you can see that the excess of wood at the top of these panels will be sawn off as it is completely useless and to facilitate the framing. I would say, oops. Why did they do that? We don't know. What we do know is when we look at the back of the panels now, we see that on the long edges and at the bottom there's a beveled edge that is rather broad, and indeed at the top there's, well, four or five centimeters missing. So if you have the archives, you know what has been done, and then you look, and then you understand what you see. That's the essence. Then, after Waterloo, of course, the panels came back. Um, and then what you think would not happen, well it did, uh, the church wardens needed money to repair the, the church, so they sold the six side panels to the art market, um, and we are here at the Brafa, so... <laughs> um, and then finally they arrived uh, in what we call now the uh, Gemäldegalerie in Berlin, and what originally were uh, six panels, oak panels painted on both sides, became all of a sudden 12 panels. 
and the back of those panels was consolidated with what we call a cradling, something that was invented to keep the panels from uh, distorting themselves. And how did that come? Well, because the museum director to the right, Mr. von Bode, said that in a modern museum you cannot force the public to look at the panel that is painted on both sides and then turn the corner and look at the other side. That's not done. So, um, in the middle, the young Max Friedländer and to the left, Hauser, who is the restorer with the white. So, here you see a, a portrait of the gallery where you can see that the panels originally were put in a new frame and you had to go to the back of the wall of that cabinet to see the back, right? And then the belief in modern technology, uh, von Bode asked for permission with his board of directors to saw those thin panels in the thickness in two and probably used a machine that looked like that. It's a machine that, is, that was normally used to make veneer, you know, to go to. to uh, and in his letter, von Bode asks for permission and uh, he said, and don't worry because we have been exercising uh, on less important panels before and I'll be there all the time, if that can help. And now we can see, if we look at the side of the panels that have been treated in Berlin, you see the cradling beneath and you see how extremely thin the original panel has become at the side one to two millimeters. Uh, Friedländer, who was in the middle of the old photograph, was a Jewish art historian. He f uh, fled to, um, before the Second World War, during the Hitler regime, he fled to The Hague, was um, helped by his colleagues, art historians in The Hague. And what does an art historian do when he needs to move away quickly? He takes his archives with him. And that is one of the most, I think, yes, endearing aspects also of those old photographs. Those are now, the Friedländer archive is now in the Rijksbureau for Kunsthistorische Dokumentatie in The Hague. And that is also a result of the history of Europe and archives uh, containing information about the material aspects can be found in the <laughs> Gemälde Galerie in Berlin. Adam and Eve in 1861 were sold to the British state, uh, to the British, hear me, to the Belgian state and uh, were taken out of the cathedral because they were seen mid 19th century as not being fit to be shown to the public. Uh, then as I said, uh, the panel, uh, the Righteous Judges was stolen in 1934 and also there, the light side of our profession, which Livia will show to you, but there's also a shadow side. Jeff van der Weken painted the missing panel and it was replaced in uh, between 1945 and 1951. He was a restorer, he was a painter, but he was also a forger. So uh, that shadow uh, zone between doing the good and the not so good. So that is what we are looking at now before the Second World War uh, and what was doomed to happen happened again of course when the German troops came into Flanders the first thing they did was well first it was uh, put in the castle of Po uh, under the Vichy regime and then it was taken to Neuschwanstein in the Hitler Museum. Uh, when the war was starting to become more dangerous than the invading troops had hoped for, uh, all the panels were hidden in the uh, salt mines in Alt Aussee, and that is where the liberating troops found those panels. So I hope that you feel with me how miraculous it is that it's still there, that it's still being cared for, the hope and joy when everything came back. Um, first it was shown in the Royal Palace in Brussels, September 45, and then you see how happy the Ghent public is when finally it comes home again. And then the beginning, that's the link with Livia, the beginning of the big last restoration. To the right, Paul Kormans, he was a chemist. 
and he's talking with the people of St. Bavo Cathedral to try and uh, get permission to do a thorough restoration. He says in his introduction, l'agneau mystique est malade, il faut, uh, so the, uh, the mystic lamb is ill, we need to treat it. And that was published in Les Primitifs Flamands, uh, Contribution à l'étude des Primitifs Flamands, l'agneau mystique au laboratoire. And it is, I think, the first enormous step of interdisciplinarity, collaboration between art historians, conservators, and chemists, and that's where Livia will come as an epitome of this interdisciplinary approach. Yeah.